Hola, bienvenidos a todos. En esta plática vamos a platicar un poco acerca de cómo hacer ciencia de datos, que es una línea eh, muy borrosa entre rapidez y falta de rigor o lentitud y modelos rigurosos. En esta charla veremos cómo Shopify logra el justo medio. We, as data scientists, are trying to help people make decisions. It should be to do that as quickly and as often as possible. Um, if we're doing work that is fun, but not changing decision making, we're not having impact. And that is also where that emphasis on customer collaboration comes in. Your customer may be an internal team, it may be an external team, it may be a user who's not paying, but if you want to impact them, you need to understand what decisions they're going to make. They want to know where to build the next store. So you need to understand how they want to make that decision and what information they need and then deliver for them. Um, psychological safety is the conditions that enable teams to be effective. It is your ability to come to work, speak your mind and not feel punished for doing so. Your ability to propose new ideas that you want to pursue without being told that they're stupid or you're dumb or laughed at. Um, and it's really important. There's lots of evidence that how psychological safety are more innovative, they're more effective. And it's this is my personal framework that I'm working on, on how to do this. Um, and the way I think about it is there's two kinds of discomfort at work. There's the kind on the left, which is the bad kind. This is uh, harassment, discrimination, bullying, the kinds of discomfort where you feel personally targeted and unsafe and like you can't contribute and come to work as yourself. And then there's the other kind of discomfort, which is the good kind. This is the kind where you don't know what the outcome, you may not know how to do what you're doing. If you are not experiencing this, hopefully you feel safe being there. So as team leaders, you want to ruthlessly eliminate the processes on the left and encourage your teams to spend as much time as possible in this discomfort on the right. Work should not be comfortable. Safe, but it should not be comfortable because you should be constantly learning new things. You should be constantly doing things. You don't know if they're going to work. You don't know if you know how to do them. Um, that's what innovation is, and that's what doing new cool work feels like. It feels uncertain. Um, but to do that, we need to get rid of the discomfort on the left to the extent that we can. But we should also understand that everyone is on a process of learning how to do this better. Everyone is on a process of learning how to interact with other humans in a way that is safe and comfortable. And we're not perfect. So you find someone on your team is engaging in behavior that is discriminatory or harassing or bullying or just mean take a moment and give them clear, direct feedback. It's hard, but it works. Um, I had a member of one of my teams um, who found a bug in a system and went in the Slack channel and was like, oh my gosh, everyone, this is horrible. We did a terrible thing. This is a public health context. This is going to affect patients. The, the, this is a huge mistake. How did we let this happen? Um, and what I did was I went to this person, I said, hey, thank you for finding this. I am so glad that you're here. This is really important and you're right. This is a bug. This is going to affect patients and we need to fix it. But the way that you came to the team about it is not okay because you need to trust that other people on your team did the best that they could with the knowledge that they had, that this was a mistake and that if you point it out, they will rally around you because like you, they are motivated to do good for patients. And so simply by pointing it out, they will come and agree with you and fix it. So have trust in your colleagues. And this worked. Um, she felt seen and heard and listened to. And she also went and changed her text in the Slack message. The team responded well, we fixed the bug and we were able to work better together after that. Um, but when that's not the outcome, when someone pushes back and says, no, actually the team is dumb and they don't understand. Um, I'm sorry, get rid of them. If they're not willing to listen to feedback, um, fire them. It's not okay. We cannot tolerate this at work. I don't care if you think this is your 10x data scientist. Really, everyone else so much more than everyone else is because they are taking the energy out of the room. They are making everyone else ineffective and unsafe, not showing up, not giving their ideas, not giving their feedback. And so when I say ruthlessly eliminate this kind of discomfort, I mean it. Um, and how to get people into this space on the right is be vulnerable. Talk about your own fears, your uncertainties, your mistakes. Um, 
say, hey, I want to try this new idea, and I have no idea if it's going to work. Um, I've led teams building complex systems that I've written um, versions of in the past, and I tell them about all the stupid things that I did. Like, oh my gosh, this time I mm, wrote software, hard-coded in an edge case, another team went and used and it. They built models for weeks that were wrong, and I had to go in and say, I'm sorry. And they had to rerun all of those models. Um, and I tell my teams about this because I'm like, you're going to do this. You are going to code in bugs. You are going to code in weird behavior. And it's going to be bad. And that's OK. That's just what doing this work is like. Um, and then reward people for taking risks. So even when something doesn't work out, if someone had a cool idea, um, they tried a new analysis that they thought was going to help provide information. It turns out, oh, the data just aren't good enough. They're not there. Um, one, thank them privately, but two, compliment them in front of their peers and in front of their leaders. So say, hey, I'm so glad that someone took on this idea. Maybe it was a really requested question, and now we know that we can't really answer that question, and we can just show the evidence to people and, like, knock this off. Deal. Thank you for finding that out for us. Um, and then encourage respectful and critical feedback. Um, we're trying to do science, um, and we need to know when we're wrong. We need to know when we're headed down the wrong path. Um, but have a conversation with your team about how they like to do this. Um, I like to spend time talking with my teams about how much they like and um, how they like to handle conflict at work. And having this conversation is hard. It feels really uncomfortable in the good way. But when you know that, hey, this person likes to receive feedback in private because they get a little self-conscious, and this other person doesn't mind receiving feedback in a team meeting, then you can encourage safe behaviors that make people feel not bullied and not harassed. And that's really critical to being able to improve our work, to learn new things, and to grow. So that's psychological safety. The next thing is making work visible. This is the title of a book by Dominica de Grandes. It is one of three business books I would ever recommend to you. I spend a lot of my time reading trashy business books. This one's not trashy, it's great. But basically, uh, I'm a fan of Kanban. I hate Scrum. That's the um, thing you're going to hear me say. If you like Scrum, I love that for you. I'm so happy for you. But whether you're doing Kanban or whether you're doing Scrum or something else, you need to know what the work is that you want to do, the work that you're currently doing, and what you've already accomplished. You need some way of listing the Kanban board because that's what I like. You do you. There's a couple of things that happen when you do this. The first is you know what you're working on. One of the biggest thefts of your time, of your energy, and of your delivery is having too much work in progress. When you have a team of three people and they have 12 things that they're working on, they're not getting things done. Things are st staying and doing and they're not moving over, which means you're not delivering, you're not changing decision making, you're not achieving your mission as a data scientist. There's lots of evidence that switching context slows people down. Um, if you are building a new data model and you have everything in your head to understand the data source that you're working on, where it fits in the complex DAG, what decision you're trying to influence, and then this afternoon you're going to go work on a post-modeling analysis to understand how your new predictive model is working. You're going to dump all of that context that you just had from that data model you were building out of your mind, and you're going to fill your working memory with something else. You're going to think about the model that, that you're working on and all the questions you want to answer about that and who the users are in this case. And just that process alone takes time. It makes your work lower quality, slows you down. If you have three people, work at most. If an emergency, you can add something, but really, really minimize your work in progress is how to be effective. Another thing that will happen is you'll realize that you're not defining your tasks well. So that team that I was talking about uh, in the beginning, part of the reason I was showing up to stand up in the morning and being like, oh, I found all these problems and my work is taking longer than I thought. It's because I was writing tickets like this. I would get a transfer of data from an ambulance service and I'd be like, yes, I'm going to clean this data. Um, and then I would spend a week doing distributions of every column, cleaning every string, deduplicating the data, um, and making absolutely no impact on the models because it would be a week of me doing this. That's not good. That's not delivery. So don't 
when you see that people are sticking around, learn how they're defining their tasks when work is not moving forward and how people write better tasks. This would have been a better task. I got this new data set. The first feature I want to build from this new data set is the number of ambulance runs someone has. And I want to add that to my predictive model that's predicting, in this case, jail bookings. Why is this a better task? Because I've scoped it as the thing that I need to deliver at the top. I want to get the number of ambulance runs someone has. And all I need to do that is a table with one row per run per person that has the ID of the run, the timestamp that it happened, and the person it's associated with. I can then go back and prioritize the next feature if I think I want to add more features from this data source and clean more columns, but I only need to do the work that delivers. And when I make my work visible, I, one, hold myself accountable for delivering, and two, enable my team to help me define my work better. Um, the next thing is ruthless prioritization. Sorry, I love the word ruthless. I'm just going to keep saying it. Um, and what I mean by this is like, now that you have this team full of like awesome, psychologically safe data scientists who want to deliver, they're like full of cool ideas about what to do. And so is your customer. And so your Kanban board, if you have one, is actually going to look like this. And this is actually going to be like, you know, five pages longer. Um, and you are never going to do all of this work. You are just never going to do it. Um, and so you need to know what is the next thing that I should pull into doing? What is the next task to work on? What is the next thing that delivers the next unit of value to my customer? And that's the thing that you work on. Everything else doesn't matter. So you might have these cool ideas to try over and under sampling. Sorry, they're not gonna do much. Um, deprioritize them, pull them to the bottom. This is an example of an early stage pro project. So um, probably I wanna not do this thing that's at the top and pull up things that are going to deliver the next unit of value. This is maybe still a model that I'm building that could be improved with the addition of some simple features. My goal is to work, it's important. Um, and this is really important because it's so exciting to want to try new cool things, but it just doesn't matter. What matters is delivering value. And being able to say, no, we can't do this because we can work on two things at once is really important to, un to help your customers understand why you can't do these things and to help your team understand why they're working on the next thing. This also enables you to say, when you finish a task, not have to ask what I should work on next. Pull the thing from the top. You don't need to come to stand up to answer that question. The top and you know how to work on it or you can get someone to help you work on it. That's the next thing that you work on. Prioritization enables you to work, with enables you to work without endless pointless meetings to debate what to do next. If you already know what's important, do it. And then the last thing is self-organizing teams. And this is really important. Try a little anarchy at work. I actually have really strong opinions about the answers to all of these questions. I'm not gonna tell you what my opinions are because it doesn't matter. Um, I don't care if you have stand up every day in the morning at 9 a.m. or if you post updates in Slack or if you do it three times a week. It doesn't matter. What matters is what works for this team. And it doesn't matter what you as a leader think. It matters what your team wants and what helps them work. I have had Kanban boards that have had really weird things to me, like a column that is the goal of the week. Hey, that's not something I would normally put in there, but that helped that team do that prioritization process without my input. They could look at that goal and pull up tasks that met that goal and pull down tasks that didn't. That came without me having to necessarily be in the room with them. That's great. At another team that had a constant task in the doing column that said, keep the Vibe. That task never cleared, but that meant that when they did have their daily stand-up, they checked in on how they're working together, and that helped them feel more comfortable and confident and resolve conflict. And now that's something that if I have a team and struggling with prioritization or I have a team that are working together, I have tools that I can offer them and ways to do it. Um, so what matters is what works. I know over the summer I had a team on GitHub projects, a team on Notion, and a team on a Trello. And like, yeah, that's harder for the project manager. But like, that's not the important thing. The important thing is what keeps your team delivering. Um, so, all right, I'm getting called off stage. And I just want to put this back up here of, you know, these are the things that are important. Wow, cool. I have five minutes left. <laughs> 
This took me overtime every single time I practiced it. So emphasis on individuals and interactions. Let your team decide how they want to work together. Let your team decide what's important. Let your team decide what the work is. Give them the context and direction and the trust and the lack of bullying that they need to do their work. Help them focus on delivering units of useful information that deliver value for the decision makers that you're trying to help and respond to change over time. You cannot define upfront what the work is going to be like, even though this is science, um, you're going to find weird things in your data. We've all found that and you have to change your plan, be flexible, rewrite your tasks, review them. And so that's it. And that's all I have to say about making Agile work. Thank you so much for being here.